my understanding too, a lot of that money comes from property taxes from the public that, that funds our public school systems here. Uh, well, yeah. All, all income tax goes to education. Is it all public or has universities cut into that? Yeah. Universities get some. Okay, you've sucked into that one. Smart move. Good for you guys. <laughs> property taxes, the bulk of your property taxes goes to education. All of that primarily is going to be elementary and secondary education. The state will supplement that with sales tax money. So whatever you need to do, you need to expand those particular bases. Creating more jobs creates more income tax. Uh, creating more, more manufacturing and mining jobs would create more royalty payments that would come to the state of Utah that you could expand as well. Go ahead. First off, uh, Congressman, thank you for showing up. That's awesome. Pizza's great. So, <laughs> I, you I got here early, so you got a piece, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> but the issue I want to focus on is deficits right now. And you've probably already heard about the budget proposal from David Cameron in England. And they're willing, they basically are willing to slash massive percentage-wise in their budget, including a 40% cut in higher education. In the United States, you already know how there's tens of trillions of dollars already were in debt. So I want to ask, first off, are you committed to reducing the deficit and the debt? And two, if so, are you willing to cut Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, the three biggest programs that are contributing to this problem? Yes, you don't have to. Oh, you want me to elaborate more on that? <laughs> no, the, the deficit has to be reduced, and the first thing you would need to do, you ought to, we ought to do, is once again part of the pledge, and that is to roll back the funding levels to the 2008 level. That'll save $10 billion right off the top. The, the difference is, and this is my problem with this administration, this administration has increased funding in every area, every single area of the budget except for one, and that is defense. The only area they want to cut is defense. And unfortunately, according to the Constitution, one of the few things we are supposed to do is provide for defense. So there's a priority situation. I would also like to go into areas and simply say there are some things that we need to do. For example, in Interior, we created the L actually conservation, the NLCW, which is a, a redundant program in Interior that deals with public lands. There is no need to have that. There's no reason to have it. We funded the LCW fund with the money we don't have. There's no reason to expand those types of funding. In NASA, if you actually want to go back to what we should have been doing and funding and funding uh, the Constellation program and not the other crap that they're trying to throw onto it, you can bring that deficit down significantly. For Social Security, the easiest thing to do is simply change the way you invest the money. Like Social Security is basically a Ponzi scheme. When it was first established, help me out here, I think there were six or eight workers for every, when it was proposed, it was 16 workers for every one person that was going to get Social Security. And just remember, when Mort Roosevelt proposed it, you got Social Security age 65, the average age for a working male at that time was 59. So the idea was no one was ever going to get it. If you really want to be patriotic as soon as you retire, die. <laughs> right, now, right now, for every person on Social Security, there are three workers. So that means the system right now is funded for anyone who's on it, and it's funded probably for me. You're the ones who are screwed, by Kai, because by the time you actually get to that age, we have the demographics of this country will be about 1.1 worker for every one person. So that means either Social Security is cut in half as far as its benefits, or those 1.1 workers have to double their tax flow to pay for the same benefit, or we do what most retirement systems have and decide to invest something in an actuarially sound way so that interest can come into the system, which actually is what George Bush proposed a couple of years ago. Right now, the federal government takes all money that the Social Security tax that you pay, and it's not yours, by the way. Just realize, I don't care what the statement says when you get it. Money is not yours, it's simply a tax you pay for everyone that's on it already. You just better hope somebody has kids to pay for you, which isn't happening. So you, you have to have the, you, and right now the federal government takes what, we, what comes in and we invest it in federal government bonds at a less than 2% rate, which means the federal government is taking federal money and investing it in federal programs so the federal government can pay the federal government interest. That's stupid. <laughs> Change that, and I think 
Social Security would be an easy one to fix. You don't have to change anything at all, just the investment pr pr practices. I'm sorry. Medicare is tougher. I don't have to do that one. Unless you, unless you change the cost of health care, which can't happen the way we're doing it right now. Good question. I'm sorry. They really need to be that flippant with you. Kind of. Yeah, sir. Congressman Bishop, before I ask my question, I just want to thank you for what you did for our state, for your service. It's not an easy thing to, to be out there, but thank you. Uh, with that said, with this, in two weeks, we hope that you're in the controlling party, not the minority. And it seems in the past that it doesn't really matter who's been in control, it's out of control as far as spending. So if we do make those switches and we do get the change that we're looking for, um, how, how can we trust the, the Republican Party to really wake up and understand what we're asking for and get your act in control and control budget and spending. Uh, anyway, that's my first question. The second question is it seems that the longer people are back there, the more or the less they listen to us and the more all they care about is getting reelected. Are you in favor of term limits? Uh, where, where, does, where does term limits fit? So those are the two questions that I have. All right, if I don't get to it, remind me the word gridlock and term limits one more time. So let's start with the first one, which is how can you trust us to cut the deficit? You can't. <laughs> like if you want to look at the history of, of the United States, this government has grown every year that has existed. It's grown under Democrats, it has grown under Republicans. I have to proudly admit it's grown a whole lot less under Republicans than it has under Democrats, but it has still grown. If indeed you're going to have a long-term solution, it can't just be promising that we're going to cut the deficit, we're going to cut spending, because we found in the past it hasn't worked. And you'd have to be basically stupid to think it's going to change in the future. What can change, though, is if you go back to a little bit of the philosophy that I mentioned very, very early on, which is why I'm so excited about the Tenth Amendment Task Force, and that is the concept of federalism. Federalism was the idea that not everything has to be done in Washington. It doesn't mean you don't have to have programs, but they don't all have to be authorized and funded and regulated out of Washington. That's what the general welfare concept meant. General welfare concept meant if Washington did something, it had to be something that was identified in the Constitution and had to impact everyone. Otherwise, those programs were left to the states, who have almost no limitations on what they can and cannot do unless it's written into their state constitution. So I gave that speech on the floor one time. I had this lady from Alabama call up and said, it's a nice speech, but I don't like what you're talking about because there are all these programs I like, and she listed them off. I said, lady, you missed the point. The point is you don't have to cut all those programs. The point is they don't all have to come out of Washington. They can come from states with allowing the money to stay there. And to be honest, blue states are the ones who hurt, hurt the most. There are some states in this country that may want a robust federal government that provides all the nanny programs you want. Fine, let them do it. New Jersey, for example, for every dollar they send down to Washington, they get 55 cents back in programs. This is mind-boggling. The other states that are in that same category are Minnesota, Massachusetts, New York, and help me out, I can't remember the other one, but they're all blue states. Those states should embrace federalism, which is why I don't think it's a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or conservative idea, and say, instead of us sending all the money down there and nothing getting nothing back, let's keep it. And if New Jersey wants to tax themselves and run every program in the world, fine, let them do it, I don't care, just don't force me to do it as well. And if Massachusetts wants to have a program for health care, and apparently they like it, it's expensive, it's stupid, but they like it, fine, let them do it. It doesn't fit in the state of Utah, which is why federalism comes in. Look, in your entire life, everything around you is based on the idea of choice and giving people options. There are 16 different kinds of Pringle potato chips. <laughs> Campbell's Soup has 160 different flavors. You may want vanilla, but you can still go to a place that offers you 31 flavors from which to choose. Everything from your cell phone plan to the breakfast cereal you buy, you get choices and options. The entrepreneurial world recognizes that the only place that still hasn't recognized that is Washington, D.C., which still insists on doing one-size-fits-all programs. That's mind-bogglingly stupid. 
That's what I want to be a federalist. If you really want to get control of this government, we have to make not only sure that the right people are there, but they have come up with this idea that you need to devalue, devolve programs back to states where it can be done effectively. Look, the only advantage that the federal government gives is uniformity. If everybody has to do the exact same thing at the exact same time, in the exact same way, we can mandate it. But if you want a program that is efficient, it is effective, it takes into account circumstances and demographics, Washington does not do it. We have proven our inability to do that. State and local government should. So you empower those, you're going to make a long-term solution. If you don't do that, it won't work. What was the word I told you? Please don't expect, if indeed my party is fortunate enough to take over Congress next year, next week, next, whenever the hell we're going to do it. <laughs> Please don't accept that the world will change significantly. The most you can expect is two years of good old-fashioned gridlock, which after the last two years, I'm going to be happy to accept. But it's not going to change significantly. Until the administration changes as well, there will be two years of gridlock, which means nothing really pro pro nothing progressive will take place, but nothing harmful will take place as well. That's simply don't get your mindset too much that a lot of things can change as well. Final ones on term limits. Actually, I do believe in term limits. Um, Utah is the only state that actually passed a term limit law in the legislative chamber, and it was my bill. I thought it was a good bill. It was repealed before it went into effect, but it was 12 years for the legislature. The only thing I'd ask you to do is two things. First of all, remember, if you're going to talk about term limits, and look, we put arbitrary restrictions on age and residency, like the service, why not? As long as it's done across the board fairly so everyone plays by the same rules. But I'm getting kind of rat strange and radical in my old age. I'm not talking, as the more I think about this, I'm not talking about simply term limits on the executive and leg legislative branch. We have a whole lot of independent bureaucratic entities out there. How about term limits on those leaders? We have, we have judges for life, some of whom are really good and some of whom live in California. Why not, <laughs> why not put term limits on them? Give them a run of 20 years and you're going to change it again. It's look broader at the concept of term limits. I think it still has some merit. People, well, government service, you need a, a significant amount of time to become competent. But you don't have to die in Washington. At least I hope I don't. Unless I die young. Which I'm no longer young, so I'm just <laughs> Anything else? So right now, um, President Obama is trying to make more jobs for people that don't have jobs and don't really have college educations. And here's something that kind of affects your region, is ATK gets um, a lot of its business from NASA, of course. And NASA just got cut on funds because of President Obama. So that affects you. I know that a lot of engineers who have degrees are now losing their jobs, and people without degrees, without college educations, are now getting jobs. How can we fix that system? All right, let me talk about NASA, and I'll try to not use any swear words. Okay. Especially for Lori Garber, because <laughs> this is all her brainchild. She's the number two person in NASA. If, the, if people at ATK, specifically promontory, were being laid off because they were trying to save money at NASA, I could live with it. But they're not. His budget proposes $6 billion a year more in funding for NASA than they had before. If they were being laid off because the Constellation program was unsafe for astronauts, I could live with it. But it's not. 